Good evening and welcome to this special program, The Truth About Suicide. I'm Liz Fawbliss. It's a topic that many people don't like to talk about, but the reality is that so many of us are touched by suicide. We have an opportunity to shed some light on this serious issue with several guests. Whether you are thinking about taking your own life or you are someone who has lost a loved one to suicide, you're not alone. There is a way out of the darkness and the pain. Take a look at these statistics from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. 44,000 people end their lives yearly. And for each suicide in America, there are 25 attempts. And the rate of suicide is highest among middle-aged people. My first guest is Carla Fine. She is the author of several books, including No Time to Say Goodbye, Surviving the Suicide of a Loved One. Carla's late husband was a physician who took his life in 1989. Thank you so much, Carla, Thank for joining for me. me I was reading the book, and my first instinct, as you took me through the experience in a very prolific way, mm -hmm. was I needed to, to shut the book down and put it away. I couldn't deal with it. And then I thought to myself, this is probably what she must have been going through mm -hmm. after you found your husband and then you sought to make sense of it. You couldn't deal. Tell me about that day. It was um, so unreal because I never thought um, that Harry was gonna kill himself. We were married 21 years. He was a very successful physician here in New York City. Um, he was at the prime of his career, and I didn't understand um, what depression was. I didn't understand. I had. I, I really had actually no experience with suicide, and he had been extremely distraught after the um, death of his mother and father in one year. And he actually killed himself one month, uh, four months after his father died. And um, he hid it. He hid his despair from me. So when I um, actually uh, walked into his office and found him lying on his examining table, he, he, gilded, he gave himself intravenous um, anesthetic, mm -hmm. I, I just went into a disbelief. I just couldn't believe it. You described the discovery in, in a very graphic way, right. and I think it was so people could understand what you had to view mm -hmm. and then deal with after the experience. How are you able or were able to get those images out of your head? Well, I think because suicide is a, a messy death, uh, it's a violent death, and those of us who lost loved ones to suicide have to deal with um, I always say, you know, suicide and death are two different things. Mm -hmm. First we deal with the suicide and then we deal with the death. So the images of Harry lying there on his examining table um, lingered maybe for the first year. But I worked very hard, and I think other people do too, to try to remember the person as they lived and not the last 10 minutes of their lives. So I worked very hard on trying to, to not remember him like that, but to remember all go the good to that he did. For help, I went to a support group run by the Samaritans of New York, which is a wonderful group. Mm -hmm. I went twice a month, where I met other survivors who had been through this. Mm -hmm. I went to professional help. I um, started going to a psychologist. I sought out other survivors. I did everything I could. You suffered from anxiety. Absolutely, you right after the experience and you also suffered from from some financial loss yes. and I bring this up to ask you how do you deal with perhaps feelings of, of anger and resentment for what he left you to deal with did you go through those different types of, of, of absolutely I was very angry I was I was in a state of disbelief it was as if you have an argument with your husband and he just kind of leaves the room and there's no way you can get him back in. And I was like, excuse me, I'd like to ask you something like, why did you do this? And I felt very abandoned. But most of all, and I think a lot of us who lost loved ones to suicide, mm -hmm. I felt very guilty. And I just couldn't believe that I was not able to have saved him or I was somehow to blame for his death 
or I didn't even see what was going on with the anguish he was going through from the death of his father. When you look back now, you say he hid his despair from you. In hindsight, and of course hindsight right. is, is absolutely right. 2020, talk to me about the signs you may have missed, and maybe this could help other people look for them. He became flattened, in a sense. He was a very good actor in the sense that he was a great doctor. He mm -hmm. kept on seeing his patients. He kept on um, being a lovely husband. But there was something flattened, and it was there. He was sad, and I said to him, "You know, maybe you should talk to somebody about this." He said, "No, I'll get over this. Um, just bear with me." And you know, I didn't push him to to get help. I just really believed that he would get over this. There, there wasn't something, you Concrete. know, the joy. There was a mm -hmm. joy that was missing from him. And, and, but I never would have thought that he was planning to kill himself. Mm -hmm. I just thought, this is, you know, I lost my father, and I was very sad, too, years before. But I, the idea of ending my life never even entered into my head. Writing the book, I, uh, I'd imagine, was very therapeutic for you. Yes. You've been able to, to move on with your life. Mm -hmm. You have since remarried. Um, have you found... Carla, again, have you found a, a light in you that can go on without those feelings of guilt or even perhaps resentment? Absolutely. Thank you for asking that. I think all of us, we find a new normal. We have to accept that we're not the same people we were before. And the world around us is not the same. But that doesn't mean it's worse. The most important thing is that we're able to incorporate our love for the person that we lost into our new world and to say that that our survival and our thriving is a testament to their lives. Mm -hmm. It's the legacy that we give to who they were do and what they meant to us. Do you still become sad when you think about him or, or are you able to see just the good that you experience with this with this I, wonderful I man? I feel sad because he was 43 years old. He was a terrific doctor. I mean, he didn't even know all of the stuff that was going on in technology, all the lives he could have he could have saved, all the people that he could have helped. And I feel sad that he kind of gave up without knowing what what could have been along the way. Mm -hmm. I feel I feel more sad for him than myself because I have the memories of him, but he doesn't have. He didn't have a future, he took away his future. And that makes me sad. And really quickly, uh, has faith played a role in, in, in Ab your Absolutely. He was a wonderful physician, and I felt that if I could incorporate the way he helped others by using his death to help others, then it just made me believe that it, his death was not in vain. And also, the p many people I've met throughout the years. I've met mm -hmm. thousands through my books, through my lectures, just to know that their deaths are not in vain because we're out there talking about it. And that's why I especially thank you for having this program because suicide is such a stigma yeah. and so many of us keep that inside. And the more we talk about our loved ones, we realize they had wonderful lives and we don't concentrate on the way that they died. Oh, Carla, thank you. It's I who should thank you I for thank sharing you. your story. <laughs> Thank you so much. I Thank really you. appreciate your being here, and I'm inspired by your strength. Thank I you I really, so much. really am. Thank you. Carla Fine, author of the book, No Time to Say Goodbye, Surviving the Loss of a Loved One. Thank you once again for sharing Thank your you. story. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk to Monsignor Robert Romano. He's a pastor and an NYPD chaplain. He is a first responder at scenes involving the death of an officer. Welcome back to our special program, The Truth About Suicide. Joining me is Monsignor Robert Romano. He is the pastor of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Brooklyn and has been an NYPD chaplain since 1998. A friend of the station, a friend of ours. Thank you so much for joining us, Always Monsignor. good to be here. Thanks, Liz. Very difficult topic, and I am very grateful that you agreed to discuss it with mm. us. Shocked to read that you have been to at least... 
50 police officer suicides, and, and you say it could be more. It, it always can. We've already had this year, in the month of January, two, two weeks apart. And, uh, you know, one is too much. Yes. And uh, when they start building up, it, it gets to be a, a very difficult thing for us to deal with and uh, to, uh, to try to explain to people. You never are able to wrap your brain around it. I, I know I've, I've had my own experiences with it, but it seems with our NYPD, it seems with any law enforcement, there's this special stigma attached to just expressing their fears, their concerns, and the fact that they may even be thinking about that. Do you see signs after all this time? Well, you can sometimes, and sometimes none at all. And you'll talk to people, you'll talk to the family, you'll talk to the coworkers, and they'll say, this person was the last person in the world that we would think of that would do something like this. Um, we have in the police department uh, tried to uh, deal with the situation by creating a program called Are You OK? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, an opportunity for us to deal with a few other issues that confront police officers, but suicide is one of them. And uh, hopefully, maybe we can save a life by being involved in it. The chaplain's unit, along with many of the different other units, counseling unit, uh, employee assistance program, uh, surgeons, um, police self-support group, and uh, another group of peer officers called PAPA. Mm -hmm. um, they're all available to police officers, but they've got to pick up the phone and, and they call. Have to call. We talk about the stigma of that machismo, you know, you, do, you don't want to say that you're scared. But then let's talk about the more faithful among police officers that understand that the teaching of the church is not for suicide. Talk to us a little bit more about that, please. Well, I think the, the teaching of the church is clear that suicide is wrong. Whether it's a sin or not, I think, is, is something totally different. I think it's something that uh, in terms of a relationship that we have with God, if God is a loving, forgiving, merciful God, then I don't think that uh, it is a sin in the sense that uh, for, for the person and for the families that are left behind mm -hmm. because that stigma stays with them and uh, they wonder, you know. But if God uh, is loving and forgiving, I think that he would realize that for someone to do this, they have to be in extreme distress and pressure uh, to do it and uh, unfortunately it happens sometimes they're in one room laughing and joking with people their family and then they go into another room and take their lives what do you say to the families Monsignor Romano it's so difficult it really is so difficult because you go to the house to tell them that their loved one is dead and then the next question is how did it happen mm -hmm. and then you have to say to them he took his own life or she took her own life. Uh, and then you just have to be there with them and hold their hand. You have to sit next to them, put your arm around them. There are no words. There are no words of comfort. The pressures of the job, I don't even have to enumerate, and I know you're familiar with. How do you counsel young NYPD officers coming in? They're hopeful, they're energetic, they're encouraged and then they see some of the worst things that society has to offer. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, when now when they're in the academy, we start this program. And, and I basically say to them, look, whatever I have to say to you today might not mean anything to you, mm -hmm. but maybe a year from now, five years from now, 20 years from now, it might be helpful, not only for you, but maybe for somebody else. So this program of Are You OK is mm -hmm. an opportunity for them to understand that there are these pressures on them and the availability to take your life is right there. The ease of that weapon just being right exactly. at hand. Uh, is there any way to talk to young officers and, and old officers alike? Maybe you secure the gun. Maybe if you are feeling depressed or upset, is there a training for that as well? We do tell them that if you feel that way, that there is an opportunity to uh, put your guns to lock them up at, at work and all that. But the point is that no matter what you do, they'll always find an opportunity mm -hmm. to do it if their mind is set on it. And again, you know, we have no, we have no knowledge of s sometimes of why. 
you know, sometimes people leave a note. That's a big help. But sometimes there is no note. And I, I only wish that uh, police officers or, or anyone that is considering suicide would just stop for a minute and think about how selfish they are mm -hmm. in the sense that they're under great duress and they end it and it's over for them. But they create a whole new set of problems and difficulties for everyone that they left behind, their spouses, their parents, their children, their co-workers. There's nothing worse than going into a police precinct after someone that they know and, and like uh, has taken their life and to, to sit there and to talk with them. It's like talking to zombies. Mm -hmm. They're staring into the, to the sky, the, the, the ceiling of the, the room, and they're, they're beating themselves up for the fact that, why didn't I see this coming? Sometimes you don't. Monsignor, I, we just have to leave it there because I think that's the most important point you could have made. If it's at all possible and you're going through this pain, mm -hmm. consider the collateral damage. Right. And maybe that might spark a light to make you reconsider. Just pick up that phone and say, I need help. When you think about it, is it that much of a difficulty in the sense, is it going to hurt you to say, I need help, mm -hmm. or is it going to hurt more people by taking your life? Pick up I the think phone. that's the thing that we have to Pick up the phone, say go see to a ourselves. chaplain, go see a friend. Thank and if you. we could save one person's life that way, then we've done a good deed. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you, Monsignor, You're for your Thanks, work Liz. and for coming here and speaking Thank with you. us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's Monsignor Robert Romano. He's pastor at Our Lady of Guadalupe in Brooklyn and an NYPD chaplain. As we continue our conversation, we're going to take a talk to a leading psychiatrist and an author on suicide, and we're going to meet a young man who attempted to end his life twice and now shares his story in hopes of helping others. So please stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to our special program, The Truth About Suicide. With us now is Dr. Michael Myers. He's a psychiatrist, a professor, and an author. In fact, he co-authored the book, Touched by Suicide, with our previous guest, Carla Fine. Also joining us is Michael Spinelli. Michael is a suicide attempt survivor and uses his experience to help others struggling with depression. Thank you both so very, very much for being here. Thank Dr. You, Dr. Myers, Thank I want to start with you right off the bat. The theme that I have heard consistently throughout our special is about that stigma. Right. It's about that feeling that you can't reveal you're mm -hmm. sad, upset. Talk to us about why that is so important to combat. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. That, that, you're right. I'm glad that you picked up on that. Um, stigma kills. That's, that's how pernicious it can be. That hesitation that a person has to actually recognize what's wrong with them or actually going to see someone. And it is associated with, the, you mentioned the illness of depression, which is one of the more common ones that can lead to suicide. And even for people who are suffering from depression, they themselves even feel a little more stigmatized if they have thoughts of suicide or if they attempt suicide. So there's sort of differential levels of stigma. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, it's so unfortunate because so many other things that befall us like you know general medical problems you know it's scary mm -hmm. but we don't hesitate to go to our primary care physician or to go for professional help and when we do that things get worse and we talked about really quickly the fact that um, suicide is an equal opportunity victimizer That's right. it, it doesn't at all yeah. say you know mostly black women or mostly right. white women or, or right. it, it touches every single mm -hmm. one yeah. I know the stigma in mm -hmm. the African-American community mm -hmm. is paralyzing that's but that's right. not only something that we suffer through no that's right and it you're right it cuts across all kind of levels of society mm -hmm. and different socioeconomic and cultural groups I don't know if it's partly because there's a sort of misunderstanding. Uh, so much of, there's, there's misunderstanding about depression that's mm -hmm. due to weakness or a flawed personality or something, but you know, it isn't. It really, it really is a medical illness. Yes, it has psychological and social factors mm -hmm. to it. 
but you talk to anybody who suffered from depression, and especially if it's resulted mm -hmm. in a suicide attempt, and they will tell you just how very physical this illness is. It doesn't discriminate by age, yeah. which brings me to you, Michael. Tell me about the day that you decided this was your last resort. This was the only thing that could end your pain. Well, it wasn't just a day. It was um, about a year's worth of dark times in my life. Uh, it started uh, late in my 16-year-old age. Um, I was dating this girl, my first girlfriend. So, mm -hmm. you know, love hits hard. Yeah. And, um, well, I just felt like something was off with her. Uh, and I began to realize she was cheating on me with my cousin. And uh, That's rough it, yeah, for anyone, very but rough. at 16. And being the first girlfriend, it was the roughest thing I've ever been through. Yeah. And uh, I also started to lose my faith right before that as well. Didn't want to go to church anymore, felt it was boring, any normal te teenager. Um, but the mix of the two, made me feel like I wasn't good enough for anyone. It made did, me did feel like no one cared. Did you use any uh, outside uh, sources to, to numb your pain? Did you try to uh, mask it in any way? Did anyone see? N no, I uh, held a fake smile for about a year. Um, and on my, s on my 17th birthday, I'll never forget it, uh, I was hanging out with the girl mm -hmm. and uh, she met me at work. We were having a great time, and the second my cousin showed up, it was like I didn't even exist. And it just hurt. And it was late at night. We were on either Bath or Harway Avenue down in Gravesend. And I saw a truck, and I laid down in front of it. And I wasn't wow. moving. And if it wasn't for two of my very close friends pulling me out of the street, probably wouldn't be here today. Thank God yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. And when they pulled you out of the street, at any point at that time or shortly afterwards, did you say, I'm so grateful that this didn't work? Or did you still Actually, fight with those feelings? I was fighting with those feelings. That's when that year of hard times began. Who that did on, you talk on my to? 17th birthday. Didn't talk to anyone. Uh, mm. Started to stay by myself. Mm. Uh, started cutting myself. If I was with my friends, I was either drinking or having cigarettes. Is this common? Dr. Myers? You can see these things, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it obviously just kept going, Michael. It kept, right? go kept going, yeah. got worse and worse. And uh, eventually, I will never forget it. I have, I used to have, I threw it out because I don't rem want to remember the memory. I had a orange and blue rope. It was like a tug of war rope. It had a black, um, sorry, red flag mm -hmm. in the middle for tug of war. And uh, I turned it into a noose and tried to strangle myself with it, with a pipe in my basement. The pain that you were feeling, I, I know where you said it came from, but there was no one you felt you could trust with that pain? There was that vulnerability there that you couldn't entrust to anyone? I kind of just tried to hide it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to know. And uh, I, I, would, I started, my mom, mother's intuition, always yes. knew something was wrong, but I wouldn't talk to her. I would I not want to explain anything, and it would frustrate her. We would get into fights. And um, I tried to strangle myself with that rope. How is your mom with you now? Is, is she very protective? Is she always kind of She's looking for signs? Actually, just back to being my mom. <laughs> Are you back to being Michael? Yes. Um, it actually wasn't until I went to Steubenville, Steubenville Ohio mm -hmm. with my pastor from Most Precious Blood and went on a religious youth retreat that I brought, got brought back into my faith. I started seeing the happiness of life again and I, I, I realized then like I want to be a musician that's my main goal that's I write your music. happy place yeah. that's what makes that's what focuses you I, on I the write positive. music I play guitar drums and if it wasn't for that um, youth conference I wouldn't have realized that life you only have one precious life dr myers uh it's a beautiful story it is a thank beautiful you. story thank you. Story it's, of redemption it's not madness, uncommon yeah. Yeah. is what i can gather from this right. and what is your best advice from what you've gotten from michael's story is it about finding something that makes you happy what would be your final words on that oh <laughs> there was a lot but of course I, yeah. I think the one thing i i say to you michael of course is thank you for sharing this with people watching You're this welcome. program you're gonna you're gonna help a lot of people with this I agree. because there are so many people who 
who don't survive what we call two very near lethal suicide attempts. Those are very, those are very serious ways yeah. mm -hmm. of trying to kill yourself. And fortunately, you know, you, you were stopped or whatever, and mm -hmm. then you've come through this and you've grown through this. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's really is such an important message. I'm afraid we're going to yeah. have to leave it there, but Dr. Myers, thank you so much for your I contribution. Thank you. Michael, thank you for being here You're and for sharing. <laughs> and thank I'm you for so happy me. that you are here. So am so I. So before I lose yes. it, we're going to say goodbye. Dr. Yeah. Michael Myers, he's a leading psychiatrist, professor, and author in the field of suicide prevention, and Michael Spinelli, a very courageous young man with a bright future. Thank you both so thank much. You. Now, as we have learned through all of our guests, don't have to suffer alone. There is immediate help. If you are thinking about suicide, someone is there to listen, I promise. Call this 24-hour crisis hotline, 212-683-3000. I'm going to say it again, 212-683-3000. I'm Liz Bobless. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you during the next broadcast, The Currents. Take care and keep in touch. Thank mm -hmm. you.